connection between violence against indigenous women, girls, and two spirits, and violence against the land and the waters. Uh, I'm going to read this because I, I don't have it from heart. I don't have it memorized. There is no doubt that the extent of violence against the environment and violence against indigenous women, children, two spirits, and transgendered people is truly tragic. It is essential that we acknowledge this fact, that we acknowledge the breadth and the depth of the violence. The question then is how will we respond to these tragedies? At the same time, we choose to remember and celebrate the lives and resistance of indigenous land and water defenders, the natural world, survivors of violence, and missing and murdered indigenous women and their families. We reject the idea that indigenous people are passive victims. They never have been and they never will be. We reject the idea that we can't protect the environment and that we must accept the destruction of the natural world as an inevitable aspect of a modern economy. How do we over overcome tragedy? How do we do more than merely survive them, but learn to flourish and thrive in the face of them? As a survivor of extreme abuse and torture, I would say from my own experience that we must understand the, the meanings of our individual and collective tragedies and that we must learn from them and grow. We must grow as individuals and movements and find ways to not only prevent tragedies from repeating, but to create a better world for everyone, one based in love and respect for all. When we aren't able to do this, we are doomed to tragedy, one after the next. When we aren't able to do this, life becomes a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Indeed, the human species is currently facing such crises and tragedy that if we can't stop them, most of us will likely perish, and we will take a large part of the non-human life on the planet with us. It is all too easy to focus exclusively on these bleak re realities, to hear only the cries of oppressed people. We can, however, also listen to the laughter, and we can also notice the resistance, like trees growing up through the concrete. Life is beautiful. Life is sacred. We are meant to enjoy it. We are meant to celebrate it and to celebrate one another. Choosing to refocus our attention on all of the gifts and blessings that we all experience every moment of every day is a part of a healing journey, and we, as individuals, as movements and communities, must have the courage to heal. Don't misunderstand me. I don't mean forget, ignore, or deny. I mean that as we struggle for justice, that we work from a place of love and compassion, and that in the face of tragedy, we assert and reassert that life is good and that life is truly a blessing. When we focus our attention exclusively on the damage done by colonialism, oppression, and perpetrators, it leads us nowhere. It is a dead end. In doing this, we give them more power than they truly have, and we position ourselves as powerless victims. It invites us to despair, to give up, to seek revenge, when we should instead be struggling for justice, love, and compassion. The truth is that we have the power. We, the people, have the power. And together, we can make a better world for everyone. So having said that, I'm profoundly grateful to introduce our three speakers, Lynn Gell, Jocelyn Ayatel, and Gabrielle Fayant. Jocelyn is a mother, a survivor, and a cultural teacher and consultant at Mother Earth and Child. She speaks out against the violence faced by indigenous women and girls and the historic and ongoing abuse of indigenous children through the residential school system, Indian schools, the 60s scoop, and the millennium scoop. Gabrielle Fayant is the co-founder of a youth-led and youth-driven organization called Assembly of Seven Generations and program manager of a youth economic program called Reach Up North in partnership with the Digital Opportunity Trust. She has worked for the, a number of national or Aboriginal organizations, such as the National Association of Friendship Centers, the Native Women's Association of Canada, and the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. She has the experience on, on a number of local, regional, and national advisory committees and councils, such as the Canadian Commission of UNESCO's Youth Advisory Group, Ottawa Youth Engagement Committee, and Walking with Our Sisters Ottawa Youth Committee. Gabrielle also serves as a board member for the Odawa Native Friendship Center, and she sings with a female drum group called Spirit Flowers and as backup for a men's drum group called the Ottawa River Singers, also known as O-Town Boys, who are here tonight. They're drumming. Gabrielle is the recipient of the 2015 Inspire Métis Youth Award. Finally, uh, Lynn Gell, 
is a, an Algonquin Anishinaabe Kwe from the Ottawa River Valley, Ontario, Canada. She describes herself as a learner, researcher, thinker, writer, blackface blogger, and she has been an Indigenous human rights advocate for 25 years. Lynn works to eliminate the continued sex discrimination in the Indian Act, and she is also an outspoken critic of the contemporary land claims process and self-government process. She has a doctorate in Indigenous Studies, a master's in the Canadian and Native Studies, and an undergraduate degree in Anthropology. She also has a diploma in Chemical Technology and worked in the field of Environmental Science for 12 years in the area of Toxic Organic Analysis of Ontario's Waterways. While advocating for change is currently part of what she does, she is also interested in traditional knowledge systems that guide the Anishinaabe forward to a good life. Along with many journal and community publications, she has three books, Anishinaabe Stories, featuring petroglyphs, petrographs, and wampum belts, The Truth That Wampum Tells, My Debewewin, on the Algonquin Land Claims Process, Makadengwe, Sharing Canada's Colonial Process Through Blackface Methodology. So Lynn's gonna start us off, uh, and I'm also gonna ask uh, people from, from the IPSM to pass around the uh, email sign-up sheets and try and make sure that everybody gets the chance to sign up. There's some on the piano there, and there's one here. So if you wanna just, uh, if somebody wants to get on that, that would be great. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah. Okay, we'll see how this goes. I have to hold it at the same time. Um, so, Kwe Kwe, Makanak Dodem, Pekor Kwevan and Dunjaba, Peter Brome Gwan Dira, Gizaget Tema and Dokwe and Dijnakas and Dashoganashi, Nozuin and Gail. Um, hi, Kwe. Uh, first, I'd like to, um, of course, acknowledge that we're on Algonquin traditional territory. I'd like to honor my uh, Algonquin ancestors, my Mohawk ancestors, and of course, also the Wendat people. It's my understanding that um, in, in, along their migration, they walked this way. So I, I'm going to cover all all the nations that I know of there. Um, I'd like to also thank um, Indigenous People Solidarity Movement Ottawa for, for the feast and, and for um, all the work pulling this together at McWedge. Um, so when Matt contacted me and he asked me to um, be a panel member, he asked me to talk about water and uh, he asked, asked me to talk about the commodification of water and I was thinking that, oh well I would talk about uh, five different kinds of pollution, that um, water pollution and offer a model for people to think through. But um, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> but I am gonna talk about the water. So um, oftentimes what happens is uh, uh, you have to look around and see what's emergent and what is current and you have to address that issue. Um, that's a very traditional way of, um, of doing knowledge. Uh, one way to think about that is you talk about where your moccasins take you. And so I'm going to talk about Chartier Falls. Um, which is a really pressing issue, as we know. So my talk is 15 minutes, I've timed it twice, and um, I'm basically going to read it, which is very uh, unlike me, but I am going to read it. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to do a traditional talk from, from memory, and that, that is uh, quite a different way of, of talking. So my talk is called Chaudier Falls Tells the Story of Creator's First Sacred Pipe. Canada's Parliament Buildings, Prime Minister Stephen Harper's residence, the Governor General's residence, and the entire national capital region reside in what is unceded Algonquin territory. As a result of this truth, a huge component of Canada's nation building strategy has worked hard to deny, confound, and push out the existence of who the Algonquin and Anishinaabe were and are. This strategy of denial has persisted for generations, and it continues today through the nonsense of the land claim process and the continued need to usurp Algonquin in Anishinaabeg territory. The, the sophistication of Anishinaabeg stories and texts is that they transcend what Europeans place on papers and in books. The Anishinaabe rely on the natural land and waterscapes to preserve our knowledge for future generations. Our migration story is inscribed in the landscape where the seven stopping grounds can easily be identified on our journey for the turtle-shaped island and where food grows on the water. Additional locations 
where location, additional locations where our stories are inscribed consist of Dreamer's Rock in what is now Manitoulin Island and the Sleeping Giant off of what is now known as the City of Thunder Bay and the array of petrographs painted across the, uh, on the rocks across what is now known as the Canadian Shield. Also, there are stories inscribed in the petroglyphs and the huge rock outcry, lo outcrop located north of what is now known as the City of Peterborough. In the Algonquin Anishinaabeg tradition, places such as Mazano Rock and Wesso Rock tell us our creation story where the four sacred elements of rock, water, wind, and fire first came together. These are the same elements that make up our sacred pipe. Further, resembling the phenomenon of human sight and the importance of a clear vision, the places where rivers or streams of knowledge intersect and where waters, where islands are located, are special meeting grounds where indigenous nations would gather. The area now referred to as Chaudier Falls is one such place. Located in the Kichisipi, what is now called the Ottawa, Ottawa River, and where the Gatineau and Rideau Rivers join between what is now known as the province of Quebec and Ontario, Chaudier Falls are located where the rest, where the Great River constricts to its narrowest width, and where three islands are located just downstream, Chaudier, Albert, and Victoria. Undoubtedly, this place is sacred. I know this through the knowledge I carry as an Algonquin Anishinaabe Quay. In pre-colonial times, Chaudier Falls were held special features inscribed with great meaning for all Anishinaabe. These features consisted of Horseshoe Falls in the shape of an almost perfect circle, representing a pipe bowl. An area where a great amount of water traveled into an underwater cavern or passage, representing a pipe stem where the constriction of the river represents the constriction where the pipe stem enters the pipe roll, bowl. These features represent the first sacred pipe given to a great Anishinaabe philosopher, Wasakajak. Wasakajak was the son of the spirit of the west wind and Mother Earth's first woman, Winona. Wasakajak had many responsibilities during his time here on Earth, two of which were naming all the beings and bringing color to the Earth. His footprints are still inscribed along the Ottawa River, and so we know he was here, and we know Chaudier Falls are inscribed with our story about the first sacred pipe intended to bring peace and friendship to the original peoples. While well, a doctoral candidate in my time, um, in, the, my, in the time I spent with Grandfather William Commander, he informed me that the falls are called Ikapuktik, which translates to Pipe Bowl Falls. Interestingly, the spiritual significance of Akipuktik was recorded in June 14, 1613 in Champlain's journals where he witnessed the Anishinaabe doing a ceremony offering tobacco to the pipe bowl. Champlain renamed them Chaudier Falls, where Chaudier translates to cattle or cauldron, hence the name today. Well, the splendor of Asakajag while well, the splendor of Wasakajak's work was carefully inscribed into the waterscape for all future generations to remember and rely upon and to offer their tobacco and prayers, all this changed with the coming of the white-faced people, their needs, and an economic paradigm that, pla that displaced Mother Earth, women, and a respect for natural law from the heart of who humans are and what humans do. Shadi Fall Falls knowledge holder Lindsay Lampert offers pertinent history that I rely on here. Canada has, a lo has long considered the Falls Crown land, where in the, in the late 1800s, Canada issued hydraulic leases so the water could be harnessed for industrial use. It was in 1908 when the various leaseholders constructed the ring dam over the entire span of the falls, where eventually E.B. Eddy took over sole operation for its pulp and paper mill production. And in 1997, the Domtar Corporation bought E.B. Eddy and ran the mills until they closed in 2007. According to Lampert, when Domtar closed, the federal government should have voided the industrial leases and determined what would be best for the greater public. Instead, in 2012, the federal government quietly transferred Domtar's interest to Energy Ottawa, a, a municipally owned power company, which in turn intends to retrofit the ring dam for additional hydroelectric generation. 
at the time, <laughs> at the time, national capital, the National Capital Commission wanted to buy Don Tar's assets, but the request for funding from the Treasury Board was denied. I'm thinking here that uh, the Treasury Board may be a good ally for the Algonquin people, <laughs> um, <laughs> because uh, it seems like they're not in good ter on terms with the government either. <laughs> um, in terms of the three islands located just downstream, the National Capital Commission has jurisdiction over Victoria Island, where the other two, Shadi and Albert, are co-owned co by Canada and Domtar. Well, that's the colonial story. And Domtar now is in the process of selling their property to the Windmill Development Group for redevelopment with condominiums, a hotel, offices, and retail space for the fat cats. The federal government is supporting this process, and while at one time Ottawa did zone the islands for parks and open space, on October 8, 2014, the Ottawa City Council changed the zoning of the, of the lands to downtown mixed use to permit this development. Both the Ogonquin and Anishinaabe and many settler people are opposed to the windmill development, but, to windmill developing the islands. They have been waiting for a long time for the industrial use of the falls and islands to end, desiring the area to be re-naturalized. And in, 1980, in the 1980s, the National Capital Commission under Jean Piggott wanted to undam the falls and restore the islands as parkland. In 1998, Regional Chair Bob Shirelli, along with the City of Ottawa politicians, also wanted to free the falls. In 2014, when the Ottawa City Council changed the zoning to downtown mixed use, Somerset Ward Councillor Diane Holmes objected with a dissenting vote. In terms of Indigenous opposition to the development, most people know by now that Algonquin and Anishinaabe grandfather William Commander had a special vision for the area. It was his vision that the sacredness of Pipe Bowl Pop Falls be returned to its natural form and the three islands be housed with several features such as a city park, a historic interpreter center, a peace building meeting site, and an aboriginal center. Regardless, in a world where money trumps vision and the need for concrete reconciliation, the Windmill Development Group's plans are moving forward. Apparently tomorrow, <laughs> they're moving forward. While well, Canada and Domtar may unilaterally assert ownership and jurisdiction to the area and the resources drawn from the land and resources, as per the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, this is, this is in fact a violation of, it, of Indigenous people's rights. The entire area is unceded Algonquin land, meaning it remains under Algonquin jurisdiction and where it may be in the developer's interest to argue that the Algonquin and Anishinaabe are unable to get together, this is erroneous and ignorant thinking. The Algonquin were once a United Nation. Despite this, in their need to build a country, the British assigned the province's jurisdiction of so-called crown land and the federal government jurisdiction of the Indians, effectively imposing a bureaucratic suffocation that continues with us today. What is worse is the Algonquins of Ontario currently have a land claim process imposed on them, a process that sets tight parameters around Indigenous people's rights that, as Russell Diablo argues, will, ass will assure our termination. What is more, the process is fraught with poor governance on the part of both the Algonquin and the governments of Canada, whereby as a result the process is nothing more than a 25-year-long job creation program for a handful of co-opted Algonquin men whose, si whose silence has been purchased in exchange for the paychecks, along with offices full of federal and provincial government employees whose ignorance has been purchased through their even bigger paychecks. A job creation project where lawyers make as much as $300 per hour. At the same time, many women and children are denied the basics of life. This is the disgusting truth of the land claims process. It is this very purchased silence of Algonquin so-called leaders that is confusing many Algonquin community members 
through the Indian Act, the residential school era, the settler land grant era that denied our indigenous people their own land, the criminalization of our culture. Many do not know the history of denial, what their Algonquin rights are, nor the economic manipulation of the land claim process that offers the Algonquins mere crumbs. Unfortunately, many Algonquin interpret the lack of so-called leaders speaking out as signifying that the process is a good process. Clearly, it is not. While this process of destruction of Pipe Bowl Falls and the imposition of the land claim process are incredibly offensive, the Windmill Development Corp tops their ignorance with the appropriation of the Anishinaabe Mowin word Zibi, which translates to river, to name their development project. It is argued the word was chosen to honor the Algonquin. It appears, it appears it has not occurred to Windmill that it is the people who determine if they've been honored. I'm not, feel honor, I'm not feeling honored, and while the Algonquin leaders in Ontario's land claim process may have sold their tongue, Girigan Zibi, Algonquin chief Gilbert Whitetuck of Quebec agrees that the word choice is an appropriation. Miigwech. Gretchen, that was really awesome. Very, very insightful and powerful. Um, so, Ani Bojo Tanse Gabriel Fain and Dishnikaz Fishing Lake and Donjaba Anishinaabe Aki and Donji Makwado Dem. My name is Gabrielle Fayant, and uh, I'm originally from Alberta, Fishing Lake Metis Settlement to be exact. And I currently live here on Algonquin Territory, unceded, unsurrendered, and non treaty Algonquin Territory and I am Bear Clan. And so that's, that's a little bit of what I just said, um, just to give you all a little bit of insight. Um, so with that being said, I'll, I'll get into a little bit of uh, some, some things that came to me as we were watching the film and as I was sitting here listening to Lynn. Um, I'm very honored to be sitting here next to these two Anishinaabe Kwe. They're uh, both very powerful women, and uh, not only do they speak powerfully, but they actually do the work. So it's, it's very much an honor to be sitting here. And so when Matt called me, he said, uh, hey, Gabby, could you come up here and, and talk about youth and uh, what youth are doing in terms of, I guess, you know, quote unquote, activism. And so I can't speak on behalf of anybody. I can really just tell you my own story. And so my own story, um, I guess where I'll start it off with is the last time I was actually in this church standing on this, this uh, stage and uh, with this probably same microphone in my hand, we were sitting here and we were talking to the clients of 507 here at this church and we were talking about the uh, sudden and very rude cuts that were made to Ottawa's homeless population. And so we were, we were talking and uh, we couldn't do much more than talk because it seems to this day and even at that point and, and in the past, it's really hard to get politicians to listen to you or to get anybody that ha makes these huge changes to really go back and change their mind or to admit that they're wrong. And so the same thing is true for what's happening in Shodier Falls. Um, you know, it seems again that we're, we're telling people that we don't like what's going on, we're not being consulted properly, and yet no one's no one's really changing their mind about things or, or really giving us any leeway to work with. Um, and so that, that brings me to the current state we're dealing with here in Ottawa. So we're dealing with um, a really harsh government, federal government, as well as a really, a really harsh municipal government as well. And uh, for a very long time, I, I thought that Ottawa was a more progressive city. I thought that Ottawa was a friendly city until these things started to happen. 
And then I really got to see, see the colors of the city. And uh, as much as I say the colors of the city in terms of um, the government and how they're acting right now, the community is very beautiful. You know, we see events like this happening and we see showcases and so many people from so many different walks of life come out and celebrate each other. So it's not a reflection on the people of the city itself. And um, so we, we have these governments that are, that are forcing these, these decisions on us. And at the same time, we're fighting with each other. So we have this really rough political landscape that we're dealing with. We're fighting with each other in organizations. We're fighting with each other uh, face to face. We're fighting on each other on social media. And then at the same time, um, this government is really imposing some, some harsh decisions onto us. So that brings me to um, a few of the discussions that I've been a part of concerning Shodhira Falls, um, because I think that's a really important uh, piece to talk about, because Shodhira Falls is right here in Ottawa and it affects us directly. So um, I've been to some, some meetings and some circles and some, you know, just chats over coffee. And for the most part, no one wants to see those developments happen. And, no, and a lot of people want to free the falls. But I think we're waiting. I think a lot of us aren't sure where we're supposed to go or what direction we're supposed to take because we are on Algonquin territory. And myself being Métis from Alberta, I don't think it's my decision to say where or what we should do. So I'm waiting for that call out. And so that's where I'm kind of coming from. And I think a lot of young people are in the same boat. You know, we're, we're waiting. We're waiting for that guidance. You know, we're waiting for, for um, more information and more direction, uh, whether it be from our elders, whether it be from Algonquin nations and communities, or whether it be from just, you know, everyday people here in the city. I think we're waiting for that a little bit. And uh, so with that being said, I want to say that um, just to give you guys a little bit of of uh, insight as to how the youth conversations are going. Um, a lot of youth are saying things like, yeah, like I'm not really sure what we should be doing, but you know, when the time comes, we'll be ready to stand up and, and do what we have to do. So it, it's, definitely not, uh, it's definitely not a hopeless situation. There's a lot of hope there. And I think the, go the same thing goes for different people from different age groups, from different backgrounds, and from different territories. I think we're just uh, waiting for a stronger direction. And you know, maybe, maybe that's here. Maybe that's what Lynn is talking about. Um, so I think from a youth perspective, I, I want to talk about the fact that we're a little bit hesitant, and I, I know that, and I think a lot of us know that in the room, that we've kind of taken a step in the backgrounds. And uh, it's, I think it's really due to a lot of the lateral violence that we witness. You know, we see a lot of people that we respect arguing on Twitter, arguing on Facebook. We see public shaming. And I think as a young person, that scares the hell out of us because we don't know if we're going to be next. So we kind of take that, that step back and we just, we just observe and we're watching. Um, but we're definitely here when the time comes and, and we're, we're kind of just sitting there. And I see a, a few of you fa your faces just smiling and, and saying, yeah, we're here. We're just waiting for, for that time when, when that, that call will come. Um, and I, I'm, really, I'm really happy with, with our community and the amount of work the youth have done. Um, youth from small ages, like 12, for example, like Thielen Kiknoswe, you know, just taking leaps and strides and, in terms of activism. And then youth all the way in their 30s, you know, really doing some good work. Um, like, for example, the Walking With Our Sisters Committee, here in Ottawa, the youth committee has, since we've gathered, the youth committee has done almost three events now. 
you know, just, uh, what do we gotta do? Okay, let's do it. Let's book a place. Let's get together. Let's get some tea. And we're there. And we're talking. So it's, uh, it's good. We're, we're in a good space. We're definitely in a good space in our minds and in our hearts. Um, but yeah, we do have to get to work. And so I, I really hope that we, we can come together stronger and uh, really let go a lot of a lot of some of that violence that we we do consciously and unconsciously put onto ourselves. So miigwech, hi hi, thank you for listening. Wache, greetings. My spirit name is the one who behaves elderly. I'm from the Bear Clan. I'm a Shkego Cree in Eo Cree. I'm from the Atawapiskat First Nation. This is where I was raised. Nagawi, a topas get the hostio, egomaga no tawi, kishesi bi hostio. My mother is from the Atawapiskat First Nation, and my father is from Jasasi bi Quebec. Nanaskoman, egipichagogwechamogoyan, jibichito tea nota. I'd like to say thank you very much for extending this invitation to me. And Maganesh the Maseo de Gabijito Te, Jibijunta Toyah, Yamiak, and for all that are present here to come and hear our women, to hear the voices of our women. Ninisitotin and Magaitonok Kitehana no Jostibiji Yamiak. I understand the teachings. What we were taught by our Mushums, our grandmothers and our grandfathers, I understand that we are to speak from the heart, and I will try my best. I did cheat a little bit, <laughs> wrote a little bit of outline, just to remember. If you can hold the feather for me. Um, I am on my moon time at this time and I'm not able to carry my eagle feathers. I, uh, I want to mention before I move on, we have uh, fasters I understand that, uh, I'm sorry, what was the climate fast? Can you please stand? I'd like to extend my greatest gratitude to all of you for doing this brave heart stand for Okawi Mawaski, for Mother Earth. I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in what one of our Sundance elders taught us. God sittings. And the bringing forth of this spiritual fast brought me to two years ago when my children embarked on a spiritual fast to bring attention to the intergenerational child warfare genocide. Wabi's village was started by my family. We are a non-governmental organization and we run purely on family funds. We don't take any uh, government funds or 
any other sources other than my family's. And how Wabi's village came to be is we are five living generations of this ICWG. They're the war conflicts known as the Indian Residential School, the 60s Scoop, the Indian Day School, and this current war conflict known as the Millennium Scoop. In fact, we have more children in care than at the height of the Indian Residential School. This in spite of the Indian Residential School apology extended by Prime Minister Stephen Harper in the House of Commons. And my grandmother was in the House of Commons receiving that apology directly from the PMO. Her name is Marguerite Wabano. Today she is 111 years old. My mother, who is also a residential school survivor, was present in the House of Commons. And my son has been kidnapped, wrongfully kidnapped by the child welfare system. Our plight started in 2003, and while in the care of child welfare, my son if you can look above us over here to the second floor, my son at four years old fell from the second floor of the foster home, landing on the main floor head first. And he fractured his skull and had a hematoma, a bleeding of the brain. And thank God for Dr. Ventura, the chief of neurosurgery, performing that life-saving brain surgery for my son. It is the only reason why my son is still here. But my son is now permanently brain injured. He suffers from traumatic brain injury, disexecutive syndrome, extreme tactile sensitivity disorder, ADHD, depression secondary to TBI. Child welfare would not give medical consent for Dr. Ventura to perform life-saving brain surgery. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what child welfare is doing. They brand themselves as protectors of our children, but are they really protecting our children? It is child welfare policy that initiated from the very beginning the Indian Day School, the inception of the Indian Day School. When the Indian Day School was not working the way the government wished for it to work, to assimilate us, to colonialize us, they moved into that Indian Residential School. And oftentimes I hear people say, well, it happened in the past, leave it in the past. You cannot leave in the past what is still in the present. And I am here to tell you that violence against Ogawi Mawaski, violence against Mother Earth, is interconnected with violence against our children, against our women, it is interconnected. And we know this through our language. In the Mashkego Cree language, we know this as the circle way of being, circle way of living. And an attack was done on our languages, on our cultures. It is the best way to break the spirits of our people, to break the spirits of our children. Remove them. Take them elsewhere, away from their mothers, away from my instructions in the language, to show them how it is that things are interconnected. Our language is our code. Our language is our mores, our ethics, our values. This is how we know about natural law. 
Long before there was colonial law, we lived by natural law. In a no the son. Geshiman to go to Pamat the Sea Hashiki, we Tamagoyak Tandiki Shapamat the Sea. By knowing the Great Spirit's teachings and in our natural law, this is key to how we are to be evolved and interconnect and respond to each other, our language. O Egomaga, Anosoma. Today, we were asked to speak about that interconnection of Mother Earth and violence against women. And one of the things I want to share is that interconnection in the language, and I'm going to do my very best. I brought my bag of hair. We've always been taught that Ogawi Mawaski is very much like us. She has hair, she has water, she has blood, she has bones, she has organs, she has heart. And it is important that we, it starts with us, how we treat ourselves, we collect our hair. We do not throw it in the garbage. We put it out on the land or we put it into the sacred fire. Same thing when we have our children. We go into ceremony when we're having our children. For us, it is our sun dance as women that I'm to abstain from epidurals or any mainstream ideas of intervention. But from the time we're little girls, some of us start receiving those teachings of what it means to be in a no school, to be an indigenous woman, to be a Cree woman, to be a Mashkego Eo Cree woman. And we are taught how to think. We are not to berate ourselves. Sometimes I listen to the language of some women and the way they respond to their own cycles, their life cycles. That is where we need to change. We need to start with us. And that's why I announced that I am on my moon time. There is a shaming that has, took, that has actually entrenched itself in our indigenous communities. I am a life giver. I am a keeper of that water. I am a keeper of our language, our culture. I am a keeper and helper to and it starts with that moon time. We go into ceremony when our children start our moon time. They go on a berry fast. I remember my daughter fell apart when she was, she thought she couldn't eat any kind of fruits and she cried and cried. <laughs> and it's the berries that we abstain from during our one year fast. And the children go through teachings, instructions. They're given those words and ways of being. And you know what? We can do our part to share those things. In the end, it is our children because they are on their own sacred journey. In the end, it is up to them. It is up to them to take out those sacred tobacco flags onto the land, to take out that water to say thank you. It is up to them to put out the spirit plates. It is up to them to collect their hair and put it into the sacred fire. It is up to them to fast. I can teach 
My grandmother used to say, I can teach you, but I cannot learn for you. Now, why am I sharing this? I'm a survivor of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. I lost my daughter in 2001. I always say I had my own 9-11 experience. And I'm also a survivor of intergenerational child warfare genocide. I've been part of the Indian Day School and I'm also a child taken survivor where many mothers and fathers, children were kidnapped for being indigenous, for being indigenous. And I'm also a child of Mother Earth coming from Attawapiskat, where De Beers is mining our diamonds. Now you have the Ring of Fire project that is coming in. You have Noront wanting to extract our resources. And every time there is a discovery of other resources they want to extract, my heart my heart aches every time there's a discovery of another mineral, a resource. Because our way, whether it's the trees, whether it's her water, her blood, her organs, that's what she is to me. She's not a planet. She's my mother. She's your mother. We're all children of Mother Earth. And what's happening to our women and our children today? Human trafficking, sex trafficking, child welfare, the substance abuse, all these things are interconnected in here. We need to go back to knowing how it interconnects. Too often we hear people regurgitate the medicine wheel, the seven grandfather teachings. What does that mean? In my language, that's waska bamatasun. And it spins. What affects one part affects the whole, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, the fire, the water, the earth, air. All of it is interconnected. If you poison one part, you poison all of it. And this, the prophecies that were given to us by our wise ones. Now we are bearing witness to those prophecies. It will be very dangerous in the future, they told us. There will be extensive digging. There will be a lot of sickness, illness, and suffering. It is us, it is us that are sick. Mother Earth has never been sick, it's us that created illness for her by our digging, by our disrespect and sacrilege of Ogawi Mawaski. So we need to pay attention. Our elders listen and know
know what is the difference between an elder and an older. Sometimes I'm listening to when our older ones are saying prayers. And I can hear that there is no calling of the woman. It's based on our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Our pipe, Espoagan, is made up of the bowl and the stem, similar to this. That's the woman and the man. If we leave out the man, we have no pipe. If we leave out the woman, we have no pipe. And when we say our prayers, we have to call all of them in. Because we cannot survive without the other. We have to acknowledge them. We have to honor them, respect them in the way we live, in the way we call prayer. And colonialism has impacted us spiritually to fear the woman. You know, sometimes we don't even want a woman to speak about what she's seeing. This is the importance of why the woman needs to be the leader. Bring those women in that are on their moon time. That is one of the most powerful medicines. And yet this culture has taught that a woman on her moon time is a dirty woman. Mana. They have taught our women that. But they are our medicine keepers. This needs to be extended out there. The raping of Mother Earth, the raping of our women, the raping of our children. It's like this. The way we see a woman our breasts are sexualized when in reality my breasts have nurtured my children. My vagina has given birth to all my children with our life-giving forces. We need to stop thinking in a negative way and we need to be cognizant in how we speak to one another. Because what's in here comes up here and out here. It is all interconnected. So we can, we can have protests and rallies. We can write letters. We can send faxes. But it starts with us in prayer. I ask, where do you want me to go? What is it that you'd like me to say? So before I even got here, when the invitation came, I put it out there. Now you help me. I will do what you want me to do. I will speak about what it is you want me to speak. Bichawash Tenamon, enlighten me. Because we are all vehicles. We're vehicles from Kishemanito, the Great Spirit. Kaushchapamatasiach, our source of life. Kagiyoshahetach, our maker. Kadebenjigit, the master. We have all these teachings. We are the experts. Go there asking for that connection. One of the teachings we received was to wear our hair in a braid. 
mind, body, and spirit. At some point, you put your hair in a braid, whether it's during the day or at night. And it reminds us of that umbilical cord, that interconnectedness, that connection to our great creator. And some of us, we work on that relationship with our great creator every day. And that relationship is strong. And some of us, our spiritual connection is but a single strand of hair. And this is what we need to work on. Much gratitude to all of you for taking the time to listen to me today. Asko Tabwe Anaman Musurge Gonganoch Taich. I am cognizant of the fact, I have an idea that some of the things we face, the challenges, are difficult at times. They take its toll on us. And that's why it's important to put out our offerings. You know, even if you don't have money for tobacco, your hair is like tobacco. Miigwech. Thank you. The strawberries are being passed around at this time. Otehemena, the heartberry. It is about love and compassion and the sharing and the asking those spirits to come and help us and to say thank you to them. So pass those strawberries along. Miigwech. So it's late and uh, it's been a long night, but uh, there's time for discussion for people who have questions for the three panelists. Um, Pretty, for anybody who's got a loud voice, at all loud voice, I know I do, I think you can probably just ask. So if you just want to, do, do, do people have questions? 